from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on Jesus' parable of the Great Supper. You will see that despite the fact that the guest list of heaven includes to this world's standard some of the very least, the power of the Savior's gracious call alone makes this the greatest of feasts. Again, the Master's proclamation, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. So far the text, let us pray. Lord Jesus, bless thy word that we may trust in thee. Amen. A party can only be as thrilling as its guest list. Unless you want people staring at each other in boredom, you've got to invite the right people. Those who will naturally rattle off interesting topics of conversation, talk about some exciting new business venture or job, bring along their family, especially a new wife or the baby, everyone's been waiting to get their first look at it. Which means it's typically the ones who have the most going on in life, the hardest working people that make the most captivating party guests. Why, when I was a pastor out in Montana, let me tell you, if you could finally convince the hardest working cattlemen to take a several hour break from the field, dress up in his western finest, and get out there on the dance floor, well now, now you had a party. But in our parable today, none of these good party guests are able to make it. I want a piece of ground, says the first. What fellow businessman doesn't want to hear all about that? Every detail from land deal to every future development plan. Yet, he'd rather keep it all to himself. I have to go see it. I've just got five yoke of oxen, says the second. Top of the line John Deere equipment here for Bible times, that is. The type of purchase any farmer could talk about for hours. I've married a wife, says the third. How can you not show her off to the rest of the town? But in each case, they beg. I ask you to have me excused. Their excuses revealing. The disappointment, and to be honest, insult, that not only are they the kind of guests you think you need, but this, your party, is just a touch beneath their taste. So left with no other option, no more interesting lot of people to invite, the master of the house turns to an admittedly far less exciting guest list. And go out quickly and bring in the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. The poor? What business ventures do they have to talk about? The lame? They can't dance. The blind can't even sit and stare at each other. All the men have to talk about is how they got their injury, how doctors can't do anything to solve it. Complain and point out everything you get to do that they used to, but now they can't. And you don't know what that's like. What would any of them bring to the potluck? 
they did. Would you read it? No sense of etiquette and lack of basic conversational skills. Most of them incapable of getting up and getting their own plate of food. Exactly what kind of party is this? The kingdom of heaven, where the very least of guests makes this party the absolute greatest of feasts. You see, not just this parable, Jesus' parables concerning the kingdom of heaven as a whole are intended to reveal how very different God's perspective on this world is from ours. His perspective on our sad spiritual condition and his solution to this our sin how contrary all these things are to our human way of thinking. His parables dismantling our false assumptions of this life and the next in order to replace this warped mindset in full with the good news of the grace found in Christ Jesus. Those impairments listed out in our parable among the assortment of guests compelled to enter the master's house, the impairments are all poetry for our sins and weaknesses, our spiritual blindness, that when it comes to engaging with one another in the perfect love our God intends, we are like a people that fumble about all your best attempts to please him by your good works, all that can do is leave you looking the fool on the dance floor. Crippled and lame, and that incapable of standing on your two feet before the eternal throne of God, we are mere beggars in terms of the righteousness his law requires to enter heaven. And like the maimed, any story you might think you have to answer for yourself could only drag the party down. Yet it's these broken souls which he invites, welcomes, and compels, filling the banquet hall of heaven with the likes of you and me. Find it no insult, then, to find your name on the guest list. The master of the house, he alone has the authority to make it the greatest of feasts, all of which makes his kingdom a gathering like no other. You see, he who said he was the way, the truth, and the life, he wasn't always the life of the party himself. Now Jesus seemed to consistently spoil the fun of the kind of guests you and I might be the first to invite. To the young, rich man who thought he had so much to offer, Jesus came across as a real Debbie Downer when he said, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. The Pharisees reserved the seat of honor at any big event who could be relied upon to captivate the crowd for hours on end. Jesus called their conversational prowess embarrassing babble, you fools and blind. Instead, Jesus went with a guest list of sinners, the sight of some of whom might make you shudder. May I please be excused? Inviting the very least to come and dine with him, that you might have no doubt his desire to come and sup with any repentant heart. 
including yours. It was a three-year dance floor spectacle, so shameful in the eyes of the temple elite that they chose to disinvite this our heavenly guest by making it clear to the Son of God just how unwelcome he was. Blindfolding Jesus in a mockingly cruel version of a childish party game. Turning him into an entertaining sight in the eyes of Herod, who asked of him a trick. And the rest, left with no more engaging topic of conversation to revel in than the preacher from Galilee, maimed to a cross. He became all they could talk about that day. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Yes, they were having the time of their lives. But in the irony of the gospel, this Jesus' all-atoning sacrifice pleased his Father as well. Not in the sick torment of the Jews and the devil, but in your Creator's eternal plan to save. For though the popular and the in-demand had done their best to make it that Jesus would never show his face again, when Jesus rose again in victory from the dead, his resurrection became the guarantee that his face is now ever turned toward you in mercy, forgiveness, and grace. No, Jesus was not the life of the party to this world's standards, but then again, Jesus defines life as a whole so differently than we do. As he said, I am the resurrection, I am the life. Thus Jesus gets to invite whomever he pleases, even the very least. For being the host with the most, there is no need for you to bring a thing. In fact, you get to leave everything. Each sad story, each awkward, embarrassing moment of this life, leave it all eternally behind. As Revelation depicts, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. With a guestless pen, with the ink of the blood he shed for you, his gracious call today is all you need to get in the door. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Which means by Christ's death and resurrection, which means set free from sin, death, and hell, all things prepared in full, no detail, no detail is left to you. Not a one. Not from what you'll wear to the big event, to the faith which answers the call, to the strength to stand back up out of your grave the day the final festivities begin. This gospel invitation itself is the power to make this party, regardless the guest, the feast of your eternal life. Oh, if you're anything like me, and you find that you have nothing interesting to share, or to the contrary, much about yourself you rather prefer to hide. The good news of Jesus' blood and righteousness is that there's no way you could make it better than by simply being the poor sinner he came to save. This is no act of desperation on the part of our God. It's the only way, the only way, heaven could be filled. In a commitment he repeats each time we answer the gracious call to gather with one another as his church. Each gathering of believers around word and sacrament, a foretaste of the eternal feast to come. Here you lift up the cup of salvation in the gospel we proclaim. 
Here you have your mourning turned into dancing through the forgiveness of sins received anew in our midst. To depart strengthened to return into the highways and hedges from whence you came to compel others to come back with you. That his house, even this <laughs> meager party room we gather in today, might be filled to the brim. Trust the Holy Ghost who has called you by the gospel to enlighten you with everything you need as we say, new light, new hope, new strength, new powers. That by faith you might begin to see things how God says they are. Namely, that from his perspective, the least in your life might very well be the place for you to start. The lowly heart being the one he might desire most eagerly to gather to his. So having tasted and seen how good the Lord is yourself, may the gospel become all your talk, become the most engaging topic of conversation to be had, as you discover that in the kingdom of heaven, there's no lack of things for us to do. The work of feeding, lifting up, giving sight to the poor, lame and blind in your life, that their sad stories might come to be replaced with this new one of Christ and him crucified. A feast for the least, indeed. Trust him to make it a good one. He promises it'll be a party you won't want to end. Now the peace that passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.